coming up today on Keys to Kingdom Living. We have his word. He's not man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. He is faithful. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And I will not turn you over to the enemy. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord shall deliver us out of them all. Oh, he already has made a way for whatever it is we got to face, but we've got to have the faith to face it and know that God is going to open up a way where there seemeth to be no way. I'm getting excited about what's going to happen in 2021 because God's going to do something that I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. I bring you greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm excited. Why? Because I know what's coming your way. It's part two of the message we began last week. It is entitled, God Has Already Made a Way. In this world, we know by the Spirit of God that the Lord is already at work behind the scenes, making a way so that when the giants stand against us like Goliath did David, when a Haman comes against the people of God, like he did with Mordecai and Esther and the Jews in Esther's day, God has always made a way when you had sin in your life. If you're a Christian today, God has taken that sin out of your life, removed the ordinances that were written against us, and has made us children of God. And because of that, he has made a way. What are you facing today that you're not sure or certain you're going to be able to overcome. Get out the Word of God. Go with me. And let's hear the segment. God has already made a way. Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Whoa. When God's presence shows up, it becomes a holy place. Moreover, he said, I am the... God of a your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Drop down to verse 10. God is telling Moses, Moses is being reluctant to what God had told him to go and deliver his people. And he says, come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, but Moses, always a but there. We're addressing that but. But Moses said to God, who am I, who am I, that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of, out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you. That's all you need is for God to be with you. With God, all things are possible. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people uh, uh, out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. The first spiritual problem that God had to address in Moses was to make himself known to him. God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God introduced himself, made himself known to Moses. Have you noticed this? Have you ever read in the Old Testament where they had altar calls? People answered them. God says, wait a minute, you can't wait. No, you can't answer this call. You got to go to the temple and you got to repent. Confess your sins, sign the letter, become a member, and then come and follow me. No. Did Jesus require his disciples when he called them? says, wait a minute, stop. Go to the synagogue. Did you know altar calls were not introduced until a little over 100 years ago? What did people do? They believed and they followed. But we got man in the way. So wait a minute, you can't do this, Gilligan. You need the skipper. <laughs> that was free. So the first spiritual problem that God had to address with Moses was to introduce himself to Moses. I am. Yes. 
I am. Well, who's told me uh, to do this? What am I going to tell Pharaoh? Tell him I am sent you. Who is I am? Whatever you need, God says I am. You can't serve God and not know him. Second issue that God dealt with with Moses was to get Moses' attention or eyes off himself. But God, who am I? Inevitably, you will inadvertently put your eyes on yourself once God puts you out there on the water. I can't swim. I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm a woman. I can't preach. I'm sure Joyce Meyer may have told God that a few times. Has, has probably the largest ministry around. Who am I? And so God had to address with that, address this issue with him so that he would get his focus and attention off of who he was as a man and put his focus on God and God's power to deliver the Jews. That's all you've got to do. Get your focus on God. I don't sit around and think about how uh, intimidating this vision is or intimidating some of the obstacles that we have to face are. I go to God. I say, God, you put this mountain here. Now help me see the way through this mountain. These two issues, hear what the Spirit is saying, y'all, because these have to be addressed in the body of Christ so we can go on and take the land. These two issues are perhaps the greatest hindrances that have been used by the enemy to prevent Christians from accomplishing God's will in the earth through us as the church. Jesus tells us very plainly in John 15 that apart from him we can do nothing. He goes on to teach us that we must abide in him and his word must abide in us. And then as we do, we're going to bear spiritual fruit. Apart from him, you can't do nothing. So you've got to get him in you, get his word in you, make it a part. You become one with the word where it's inseparable, indistinguishable between which part of you is you and which part of you is God. And then you'll have victory to overcome the giants in the land. So God dealt with those two issues with Moses. Now turn with me over to 1 Samuel chapter 3. This is when Samuel is a young boy serving the priest Eli in the temple of God. And it was a very sad time. The lamp of God was going out. The priest, Eli, was getting old. His sons were cre uh, committing abominations in the temple. And it's at that point that God comes and makes himself known to Samuel. Verse 1. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before e Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days, and there was no widespread revelation and it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying in his place and his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see. And before the lamp of God <coughs> went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, <coughs> that the Lord called Samuel and he said, Here am I. So Samuel heard him, correct? So he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you have called me. And he said, I did not call, lie down again. And he went and he lay down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel rose and he went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. He answered, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. God introduced himself to Moses, didn't he? And he got his, Moses' attention off himself and on God so that he could use Moses as his deliverer. And so he comes to Samuel, the boy, and he says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. 
Who did Samuel go to after the Lord called him three times? Eli the priest or man. He went to man. When people are in the place between being called of God and not knowing God, and everybody's at that place when they come to Christ. You believe in Him. There's a calling on your life. You know you've got a purpose because everybody that's born again has a purpose from God, but you don't yet know God. It can cause them to run to man. This is why you need godly and spiritual shepherds or people will do as Samuel and get their attention on man and possibly be led astray. Samuel didn't realize that it was the Lord because God had not yet revealed his word to him. However, God was about to anoint Samuel's ears to hear and his eyes to see and his heart to know God's will, both for he and for Israel. God was about to do that to Samuel the prophet. I love that. When God touches you and he opens up your, the eyes of your understanding and you become enlightened, enlightened where you no longer see these as physical stories, on physical words on physical pages, you start seeing the spiritual meaning. And when you see the spiritual meaning coming alive, it gets all inside of you and it transforms you and it gives you boldness because God has not given you a spirit of fear. Power, love, and a sound mind, the Bible says. Now turn with me to Jeremiah. Is this helping you? Stay with me. Jeremiah 1, <clears throat> verse 4. Then the word Lord came to me saying, Isn't it interesting that he said, The word Lord came to me saying, it's like he saw this image. He came to me. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. Before. Say before. before. See, he already had a plan. He already made a way. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, set you apart. And I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I. One of those but gods. Oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am a youth. For you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Isn't that what Peter told the Jewish leaders who told them in Acts? No longer shall you speak in that name, the name Jesus. And they said, we cannot but speak those things that we have seen and have heard. Whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not, church, be afraid of their faces. For I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord, then the Lord. After he corrects uh, Jeremiah, he says, Then the Lord put his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day. When the word gets inside of you because God has anointed you to receive it, then you, you will see this. See, I have this day set you over nations and over kingdoms to do what? To root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. The anointing of God, the authority of God came upon him because the word of God became alive to him when the word of God becomes alive to you. God gives you authority over the kingdoms of this world to carry out God's will. So what kingdom is going to stop the church? None. This is now the third prophet that the Lord has directed me to use as examples to show us three witnesses to establish the truth. What can and will happen when God calls people who do not know him or, do not, uh, or his word has not been revealed to them? Each of them made similar mistakes. All three had their attention either on man or on themselves. Very common when people are called but don't yet know God. Now let's talk about the hope that is only found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Since Satan and the rulers of this world couldn't stop what God had foreordained for man to accomplish in the earth, 
God is going to remove the hindrances which have been used by the enemy to hold believers back in fear. I want you to think about this. This is so powerful. This is liberating. God used Jesus to remove sin away. It's not a problem for believers anymore. It's not a problem for anybody. Matter of fact, he shed his blood for everybody that's in hell right now. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, the problem is not the lack of the blood of Jesus Christ. The problem is the lack of belief in the blood. So God is going to remove the hindrances which have been used by the enemy to hold believers back in fear. How much fear is going on right now in believers in America? It's, it's epidemic. It is. So let's go to Isaiah 14 for a second. Lucifer said in his heart, I will be like the Most High. I, 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 I. I think it's like six or seven times he, he pronounced himself as being great or going to be great or do great things. What he did was he introduced sin, self, into God's creation. And then he took that indoctrination and sent it over to Adam and Eve and they became partakers of self. Satan has used self to hold the church back. But God made a way. He, if he made a way to eradicate sin and get that out of our lives so that it cannot be used against us, then God has made a way for us to overcome self. Self will put you in fear because fear is how self protects itself. Faith is what we use to protect our spirit man. Fear is a perverted use of faith because it's in self and not in God. Therefore, if you put me in fear, matter of fact, I had something going on and there were police involved. And I said, I fear for my life. And they weren't going to do anything about the situation whatsoever. But the moment I said, I fear for my life, they said, we are, we're going to take care of this right now. The law enforcement officers are trained. If someone feels in fear for their life, they have, they're obligated to take action. The world is conditioned to act out of fear. Fear moves people. But God says, I've not given my church a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. So how are we going to overcome the fear that is holding the church back from being the glorious church that Jesus Christ died that we might be and do what God has called us to do from the foundation of the world? We're going to die to sell. And that's what God is saying at the end of this year. Church, you've got to die to self because fear is causing you to sin against my commandments. And if you'll read in Revelation, the first list beyond uh, fornicators, homosexualities, and everything else that is listed there, the first thing that is listed is cowards will not inherit the kingdom of God. Fear will keep people out of the kingdom of God. So God says in Revelation 12, they overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb. There's our sin dealt with. The word of our testimony, sharing our faith, and they did not love their lives to the death. When we don't love our lives to the death, then that means we love God more than anyone or anything else. And when we do that, that self, that Satan rose up in heaven against God with the self that Adam and Eve rose up against God in the garden. That self will be done away with in our lives. And there is going to be a passion burning inside of us for the freedom that God has done to deliver us from the spirit of fear as the church. And we're going to be a roaring lion like the world has never seen since the first church, the early church. When people believe in God but still do not have an understanding, a spiritual understanding of God or who they are in Christ, which is their spiritual identity. 
Satan will use intimidation tactics. You know, tactics like shaming you. It works. He knows it works. He uses shaming tactics to hold people back from stepping out in faith. Who am I that I should do what the Lord has commanded me to do? Who am I? Wow. Shame, condemnation, guilt. Here's the hope in plain terms. God didn't just save us. We are born again by the Spirit of God. This is how God bypassed Satan and the ordinances that were contrary or against us as fallen people, people outside of covenant. Now that we're born again by the Spirit of God, there is nothing on this earth, and I mean nothing, that can be used to keep us from overcoming the world and doing exactly what God placed us here to do once we know God by the Spirit. We've got to know God by the Spirit. A lot of people have a mental understanding of God, which is very limited, very weak. But God's revealing himself by his Spirit in this hour. Now, for this to occur, God has given us spiritual proof, scriptural proof, what must transpire so that we can overcome Satan and become strong in the faith and then do great exploits. God is about to reveal to believers who he is and who they are in Christ. That's why he gave me this message. He says, I've already made a way. Now I'm going to make the way, the way known to you. This will empower believers around the globe to be able to finally die to self and overcome Satan. When you die to self, you will automatically overcome Satan. Then... Then, like Jesus, we will fulfill God's will in the earth as the church. Didn't Jesus tell us in Matthew 16 that he would build his church on the rock of the revelation of who he is and who we are in him, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church? Isn't that what he said? By the Father giving us life by his Spirit. We are born by his Spirit, y'all. I love this. This is such a powerful revelation. If you really get it in your spirit, it will set you free from the flesh. By the Father giving us his spirit, he bypassed everything that Satan has ever or could ever possibly use to keep the church from completing God's will and becoming who God has called us to be in Christ Jesus. We are born again of the spirit. And Paul took it a step further in Galatians says, there is neither man nor female, free nor bond, Jew nor Greek, but we're all one in Christ Jesus. Somebody needs to give him praise. There is nothing. When I am in the Spirit, I am not a gender. I am not a color. I am not an ethnicity. I am a son of God. And when you're in the Spirit... Come on, help me preach this today. Get that in your spirit, y'all. Well, you're this and you're that. What is the world using right now? Race baiting. Satan knows it works. And he shames us. You racist? He don't say repent and believe the gospel. He says get politically correct and we'll accept you. We have got to quit seeing ourselves as, as flesh and blood. We are the church of the living God, and Christ's Spirit is inside of us. And when we walk in that revelation, the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against us, the church. Right? Now, all that is needed is for us to, over, for us to overcome is for God to open our spiritual eyes. Open our spiritual ears and our hearts to the things of the Spirit like he did Moses, Samuel, and Jeremiah. And we shall be transformed once those are open into spiritual beings and earthly bodies that shall never be able to stop us. 
So in conclusion, how many are ready for transformation by the Spirit of God and be released from the limitations caused by the weaknesses of your flesh so that you can do and become who God intended you to be? How many is ready for that? I want you to line up across the altar. We're going to pray for you. We're almost out of time, but before I leave you, I know by the Spirit of God that the, the Word of God has done exactly what God sent it to do, and that's to touch hearts and to change lives and to transform us from being soulish beings into spiritual sons and daughters of God so that through Christ we're able to take the land as the church. Today God has challenged us to lay down the flesh to pick up the cross that Jesus tells us in the gospel to take and to follow him. Today I want to ask you, are you living your life for Christ or are you living it for self? That is the thing that needs to be addressed today in so many. Our body is not even ours because we've been bought and paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore we are to live for God who has given us life. If you've not made Jesus the Lord of your life, maybe you've prayed and asked God to send his spirit and make you a child of God and you believe in Jesus as Savior, but you have not fully surrendered your heart and your will to God and you're living with obstacles and issues that you know if you would just surrender, God would give you victory over those. Well, my prayer is that today, You'll humble yourself right there, bow your head before the presence of God, and you'll say, Jesus, I know you as my Savior, but today I make you Lord of my life. I surrender my desires, my will, and my life to you. And I receive the mantle and the mandate to fulfill your purpose in my life from this day forward. If you prayed that, you're about to step into some freedom that heretofore you have not been able to receive because the flesh cannot glory in God's presence. The flesh has to be put off. If you prayed that, we would love to hear from you. Contact the church office and let us know. Let us know how the word that comes through the airways from this ministry has impacted and God has used it to change your life. We love to hear testimonies of what God does through his anointed word. If you have any prayer requests, please uh, send those in. You can either email or contact the church office. We always pray over them, and we agree with you that God's going to move mountains and destroy yokes through the anointing that's in his spirit and in his word. So I get ready to leave you today. I want to encourage you. When the enemy says no, God says yes. God bless you.